Hello, my name is Kishwani. This K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the official SAT study guide. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The problem that we are about to solve is the one that you will find on page number 859. Please turn to it. Page 859, and today is our lesson number 17. 100, lesson number 117. 859. Let me just make sure that I did not skip a page. That is correct, 859. Number 7. These are medium, prob these are medium problem. This section has 16 questions which means the first one-third, five or six are easy, the next, uh, next one-third, five, five or six, middle five, five or six are medium, and the last five or six questions are going to be hard. These are medium questions. Number seven, we are given two triangles. This triangle we know is the right angle triangle because they tell us this is a 90 degree, this is x and this is y, and this we are told is u, v and w. The fact that they are using three different symbols to denote these three different angles, that tells us that these are three different values of angles. They are not the same angles. The question simply is, what is their average? What is the average of these five angles? Well, how, do we, how do we go about it? Well, we know that the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180. The sum of the angles in any triangle, in any triangle, doesn't matter what the triangle looks like, whether it's a right angle triangle, whether it's an obtuse triangle, acute triangle, equilateral triangle, isosceles triangle, it does not matter what the triangle looks like as long as it's a triangle their sum is going to be 180. Same thing here x plus y must equal 90 because this is 90. If this is 90 then 180 minus 90 is 90 which means x plus y must equal 90. We want to find their average of these five angles. How do we find the average of average of any numbers? We add them up and divide by how many we how many we have. Here we have five different angles. We do not need to know the individual value of values of these angles. Not only that we do not need to know the individual values of the angle, what's more is that it is impossible to figure out what x is, what y is. It is impossible to figure out the individual values of these angles. And we are not interested in that. All we need to know is that their sum, the sum of these five angles must be the sum of these five angles, x plus y plus u plus v plus w, must be 90 plus 180, which is 270. And there are five of them. And therefore, their average is going to be 270 divided by 5. 270 divided by 5. Let's find out how many fives, how many fives in a 2? 2 has no fives. That two goes and joins seven becomes twenty-seven. Twenty-seven has five fives. Five fives are five fives are twenty-five. The remaining two goes and joins the zero becomes remaining two goes and joins the zero becomes twenty. Twenty has four fives. The answer is fifty-four. That was one way we could have figured out what is two seventy, what is two seventy divided by five. Another way we could have figured out what 270 divided by 5 is to simply realize that 270 divided by 10 is 27. If 270 divided by 10 is 27, then 270 divided by 5 must be twice as much. 2 times 27 is 54. Number, number 8. That's it, we're done with it. Number 8. Number 8. Try not to use your calculator for no strange reason, do you understand? There is no point why you should, there is no reason why you should have to reach for your calculator in a simple problem like this. Use your brain. It is okay. I have seen kids reach for the calculator for every little tedious thing. They don't want to think. They don't want to use their brain. You ask them how much is 12 minus 7 and they reach for the calculator for crying out loud. Number 8. We are given a number line. We are told that this is x cubed, this is x squared, and this is x. The question is which of the following could be the value of x? 
which of the following could be the values of the value of x. Let's start from the bottom. E says, E says, 3 halves. 3 halves is more than 1. And if you square a number that is more than 1, it's going to be more than the original number. 3 divided by 2, when you square it, you get 3 squared over, over 2 squared, which is, which is 9 over 4. And 9 over 4 is actually more than 3 halves. 3 halves is the same as, we have to make the same denominator, we have to make the bottom 4. So if you make this 4, you multiply the bottom by 2, you have to multiply top by 2, this is 6 fourth, this is 9 fourth. So x squared here, x, x squared here is more than x, as we would expect traditionally. Traditionally when you square a quantity, it gets larger, as long as the quantity that you're squaring is more than 1, which is the case here. So this is, this is the reverse order, we are told that x squared is less than x. This is not it. The answer most certainly is not D. D says 1. Well, in, in, in that case, this is 1, this is 1, and this is 1. In this case, x is equal to x squared, which is equal to x cubed. Obviously, D is not the answer. Let's look at C. C says 3 quarter. Let's see what happens. 3 quarter, when we square it, we get 3 squared over 4 squared, which is same as 9 over 16. So we have to make this into 16. So we have to have the common denominator so that we can compare the two. Multiply the top and bottom by 4 and you end up with 12 over 16 and this is 9 over 16. This is our x and this is our x squared. As you can see 12 over, six, 12 over 16 is going to be more than 9 over 16. That fits here, that, that pattern fits, fits here. Let's go one more time. Let's do one more round. Now we're going to cube it. We cube over 4 cube, which is 27 over 64. So now we have to make everything into 64. Multiply top and bottom by 4. Multiply top and bottom by 4. And here we have 4 times 4 times 4, which is 64. And here we have 64 times 3, uh, 16 times 3. And here we have 64 again, 16 times 4, 16 times 4. It's going to be 64, and here we have 9 times 4, which is 36, and this is 27. This is 27. What does this work out to be? This works out to be 48. This works out to be 48. And this, this was our x. This, was, this, was our, this quantity was our x squared, and this quantity was our x cubed. So as you can see, x is more than x squared, which is more than x cubed. Why? Because it's a fraction. It's less than 1. That's the only concept that they're trying to test here. When we have a fraction less than 1, between, between negative 1 and 1, if you square it, or if you raise it to a different power, it gets larger. It gets larger. Or between, not between negative 1 and 1, between 0 and 1, I meant. Because negative introduces more complications. That's it. The answer is D. The answer is D. X, X would be... Because, you see, we have to multiply everything. We have to multi multiply top and bottom by 4. We have to, in order to make compare this quantity versus the square, then we have to multiply top and bottom by 4 again in order to compare this against the cube. So now x is 48 over 64, which is same as 3 quarter. This thing, this thing is same as 3 quarter that we started out with. And then the square part is going to be 36 over 64, which is same as 9 over 16. And, uh, which is same as 9 over 16, and this is 27 over 64. That's it. The answer is C. Let's very quickly see why answer is not A or a B. Instead of, instead of going in reverse order, had we, con had we started with A, this is what we would have found. A says negative 2, negative 2. So we have negative 2 here, and then negative 2 squared, which is positive 4. And of course, positive 4 is not less than negative 2. That rules out A. B says negative 1 half. Let's see what happens with negative 1 half. Same exact thing is going to happen with negative one half. Negative one half, and then this is going to be positive one quarter. Obviously, a positive quantity cannot be less than a negative quantity. So that rules out B. The answer is C. Number nine. Answer is C because we already saw that D does not do anything. D just remains one. X and X squared and X cubed, they're all one. And E, as you square it and cube it, it gets larger and larger. 
Number nine. We've given this point 1 and 3, I'm going to give it a name, instead of calling this point and that point, let's give it a name, let's christen it, let's call it A. And then we are given another point here, which we are told is H and K, let's call it B. The question is, what's the value of K over H? It's a tricky question, what's the value of K over H? What we have to understand here is, what does this ratio represent, K over H? It represents, in fact, the slope of the line. Let's find out. You see? Slope here would be rise over run, which is a change in y versus over change in x. Let's start from here, point O to point B. From O, o to B, don't go from A to B, go from origin to B. Here it is 0, 0. Okay, watch what happens. So is k minus 0. Change in y is k minus 0 over change in x, which is h minus 0. Which is exactly what they are asking here. They are asking us what's the value of k over h. In other words, they are asking us what's the slope of this line. Well, we can very easily find the slope of this line now by using the the slope of the line stays the same throughout the line, obviously. So now we can very easily find out the slope of this line by using this point O, origin, and point A. Let's find out. So again, from, from O to A, this was from O to B. From O to A, the change in Y would be, from O to A, the change in Y would be 3 minus 0 over change in X, which is, 1 minus 0, which is simply 3, and that is your ratio of k over h. The ratio of k over h is the slope of the line, which we just found to be 3. The answer is A. The answer is A. I will see you tomorrow, and we'll continue with our problems here on the next page, on page number 800 and 60. Alright? I know.